welcome back to morning express now to continue our discussion on the program uh we are now being joined by Caleb Obagwena Esquire, who is a legal practitioner, and he'll be uh, speaking to us this morning on ways of uh, or how legal education uh, is shaping Nigeria's political landscape at a time when the polity is quite heated. Hello and good morning. Yeah, good morning it's, to all distinguished viewers. Thank you. It's very uh, pleasing to have you in the studio with us this morning. Thank you. I must say, it's also a fine time for legal officers in light of the current administration's drive to improve the judiciary's welfare. We're looking good. <laughs> <laughs> well, away from that, that's on a lighter note. It's also a pledge from this administration to have the 30th of government working. And many persons are beginning to appreciate the role of legal education in terms of what Nigerians can demand for as their rights. But it's also greeted with the skepticism of how much our constitution needs to be amended, discarded, or re-amended. Let's get your thoughts on these perspectives. Okay, first and foremost, you see, uh, one of those who have the view that the legal profession has a major role to play if Nigerian society is to be better today, and one of those people that have the view that lawyers hold the society at ransom if you are to get the very best of governance in Nigeria. So looking at the constitution, you could see it's one part of the book that becomes the, we say, the ground norms of our society, which has three tiers, like you meant, three arms of government, rather, which is the legislatures, the legislative arm, the executive, and as well as the judicial arm of government. And you could see, for we lawyers, we play a major role in all these three arms of government, especially with the judiciary, which is the seen as the hope of the common man. And I think it's better we, we talk more on that. Thank you. All right. Well, we're well, still staying with uh, issues surrounding uh, how much Nigerians know their rights and what to demand for, especially from elected, uh, elected officials. Uh, I, I, I know that some non-governmental agencies, organizations are in the business of creating projects, especially in rural communities, to uh, monitor constituency projects of elected officials. Well, how can individuals, the electorates themselves, help out in ensuring that while these projects are going on, they know how much has been disbursed, they know how the monies are being spent, and they know the level of work that has gone into or is going into the projects? Okay. Uh, one of the greatest challenges we have, like uh, the, we rightly mentioned, is the constitutional review. A challenge has been Chapter 2 of the Constitution, which has to do with fundamental directives, which or to hold the government accountable. But particularly, there have been a chain in that procedure, which you could see in the provision of Section 6, Sub 6, Paragraph C, which is one of the challenging provisions of the Constitution, which makes this right non-justiciable. That is, you can't even approach the court even when you don't get the accurate accountability from these elected leaders. This has been a chain, and I think that that particular session should be reviewed to reflect that people can actually challenge the government and their activities so that they can be held accountable. Well, well in talking about accountability, Serap, it recently uh, sued the President of the Senate, uh, Gotswil Akpabio, and also Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tajuddin Abbas, uh, for over uh, the 21 million naira salary fixing thereabouts that you know took place recently. And we also saw in the news today that the same Serap is suing the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for his refusal to reverse the new fuel uh, pump price, or to reverse the fuel subsidy removal. I beg your pardon. If Serap continues to sue this way, yet there seems to be very little to no knowledge as to what is going on in the courts, how effective is this issue of taking these leaders to court when it appears like there's really nothing going on? Uh, well, that is where the judiciary has a major role to play, to be sincere. And that is why lawyers are actually involved in the decision-making, whether we like it or not. We are considered as ministers of the Temple of Justice, and we should go to the appropriate court and get good lawyers that are skilled in this aspect of law and see how they can demand justice on this ground. And they should not try to 
politicize everything, including the judiciary. And I think that's where the challenge is coming from. Well, well how, how do people know what particular courts to approach and the proper means of, uh, you know, going about it? What lawyers should they engage and what courts should they approach in order to sue those who are in power and hold them accountable for their actions or inactions? Okay, good. Like for, for me, I keep saying that the legal education is not limited to lawyers only. The legal education is something that the federal government should invest in to educate its citizens if they want growth, if they deem to want growth. Yes. Now, one of the things that determine the factors of determining the judicial of the court is usually the laws creating this court. And one of them that stands out is the Constitution. Now, the Constitution creates powers to court, like federal high court. You could see clearly Section 251 of this Constitution, which make it very clear that the federal high court has jurisdiction regarding federal government agencies' interpretation of the Constitution. So the federal high court, for me, is the appropriate court by this provision I mentioned earlier. Now, now, now let me paint a scenario. An election has taken place. Uh, probably the opposition party has lost and then someone has been sworn in. People are agitating and a statement comes out, if you don't like the, re the outcome of the elections, go to courts. <laughs> I believe I believe yeah, sure. this is this is a picture that is very vivid in your memory. Sure, very Go to well. courts. How much have our courts been reduced to in this situation where such mocking statements can be made about the judiciary that you can just go to them and not expect justice? Okay, and first of all, let's trash that issue of going to court. Now the truth is this, you see, it's not just going to court. The court requires some setting evidence how to prove this evidence now when these evidence are not proved in the right manner the court cannot do anything what you must observe is the court is an unbiased umpire and will not delve into the arena so lawyers have to do their homework before coming to court now cases are not won in court let's be clear cases are won in the law office in their conference room where lawyers decide the position of law and stick to how to prove them. Now, the judges, is the, the judicial system we have in Nigeria is such a way that people always clean on social media justice. Social media will not give you the outcome that we see in judgment. It will not. Now, looking at the Peter Obi's case and the articles case in the just concluded presidential election a few uh, years, uh, that's one year ago, I yeah, guess. About year now, ago. you could see that the social media already deem it fit that Peter Obi should win in court based on the outcome. But the question is, how do you prove? Because the court is governed by the law of evidence. Evidence Act governs the court, which is the Evidence as Amended Act 2023 we have now. And these are the laws that lawyers are supposed to look into to see how to prove their case. Sometimes I don't even blame the judiciary because the, the, the legal practitioner and the judiciary work hand in hand. And I keep restating that if Nigeria is to be better today, we have to improve the standard of not just legal education, but improve the skills. And I bet you, the Nigerian Bar Association have been doing so much to educate lawyers, but the truth is, the participation has been less. And well, that's the problem. Well, well Caleb, your, your, your system, the judiciary itself, has been accused severally of being in the pockets of the executive. This is something I am very sure you are very aware of. How do you defend this? And how would you say that the judiciary is working to reinstate its honor that it has always had at a time when Nigerians are beginning to doubt its uh, fairness? Okay. Now, the, the truth is this. You see, when it comes to the judiciary, we have what we call the hierarchy of courts. We should not play down the role of this hierarchy. Now, if you are not satisfied with the decision of the court, you can always appeal. You can get to the Court of Appeal, you can get to the Supreme Court, and if you are not still satisfied with the issue of the Supreme Court, you can apply for reviews. These are the things that we are not open to as public. And when we are not open to these truths, we think that the judiciary is in the pocket of... It's not true. There are reviews you can call for that a decision be changed or checked. And all this must be timely, except the lawyers, maybe at the background, has played the role of not pushing. And now that's let's, the truth. let's bring the common man back into our conversation. Now, a lot of the law we talk about in Nigeria is first hinged upon our 1999 constitution as amended. Good. Now, one of the lacunas, people would say with that constitution is the lack of a referendum, which will allow for more citizens' participation. One, in capturing that line in the constitution that is famous for saying, 
we the people of Nigeria. Okay. A lot of people blame it as a post uh, military industrial complex document that solely protects the interest of the federal government. How do we begin to engender this conversation? One, at the people's parliament, which should represent the voice of the people and then even take it down to the presence of the most sought after referendum. Okay, and this is where public education comes in. I think the Ministry of Education is not doing so well to organize session to educate the public. Now, first of all, the statement with the Nigerian people is seen as a preamble, which is the spirit behind the law, but does not in any way act or add to the constitution itself. In short, that particular statement is not even part of the constitution. constitution. So, you see, with that statement already, you see, like you earlier said, it protects the federal government. But if you look at it, if we have lawyers who are working hand in hand to ensure, because to be fair with you, we have a call to ensure that the people, the people get justice. It's not on the ground of technicality. It is justice should be seen as done. So I think the Ministry of Education has a lot to do with educating the public on issues on how to go about the issue of referendum, to be fair with you. And when public education comes up on a daily basis, we don't see those things anymore. Now what we see now is promoting media, comedy and the rest. But we need to start promoting education primarily in Nigeria. We ought to. Now let's also look at a dynamics in which another challenge with the north and south in terms of penal codes and criminal codes Good. at some point sharia systems it almost feels as though we are one republic but when we transverse across cultures the law has to tilt to the ethnicity or religion as practiced <laughs> in such sections how do we move past such okay, divisions first, first of all we need to know the history concerning that now the truth is this the criminal code was often the law that governed the entire Nigeria. It was not sectionalized between the northern part and the southern part until a certain time where customary laws were to be abolished. Now, customary criminal laws as to being abolished is the sense that nobody will be punished again unless the law is clearly written down. And you could see that in the provision of section 36, 12 of the Nigerian Constitution. Now, I haven't had a prompt knowledge of any laws that are not written down will be abolished. These guys have to maintain their, their sectionalized law or, let's say, their religious law. So they have to carve the penal code so that it will be written down. The punishment will be prescribed for as of 1959. And when that was done, they fell back into the provision of the Constitution, which says that your law must be written down and punishment prescribed. You have a locus classicus case we always make mention when we teach students they call it aoko and fagbemi is a well-known case that established the principle of written down laws so i think they took advantage of the penal code being written down and to be fair with you there's nothing more we can do about the way forward because this is something that has to do with the region the northern part penal code the southern part criminal code but what abuja was able to do because they are at the center they have both criminal code act and the penal code act depending on the indigene of the so the, the the defendant now before the court well, well let's talk about the sharia um, law especially in in the northern parts of the country uh, i believe uh, there are there are people of different religions in states where sharia law is practiced and sometimes we have seen in certain instances where people who are not of the muslim faith tend to be judged under the Sharia law. It has happened in Nigeria. How do we create a clear differential and say that, oh, these people are not Muslim, so Sharia law certainly does not apply to them because the Federal Republic of Nigeria is not governed by Sharia law. Okay, good. I think on that part, I think the lawyers on their own part fail to raise timelessly the preliminary objection because that should not be the case. Now, in the case I mentioned of Aoko and Fagbemi, you could see that that case set a limelight as to what should be applicable. And the truth is this. In that case, it said that it's about the person, the person subject to the crime and not the locality. So if I'm a, from the south and I commit an offense in the north paraventure and I'm to be tried, 
definitely I should be tried by the Southern Law, which is the criminal court, except, now this is an exception, except the offense I committed is clearly stated in the location where I'm found, and if it's proven guilty, I will be charged for it. For example, the issue of adultery. Adultery is an offense in the North, but is not an offense in the South. So if a certain person commits adultery, in as much the person you are committing adultery with is not subject to that law, then you may be free from that provision. How, how about how about the the particular vicinity or location is where, where, where the jurisdiction exactly where the crime was committed? Yes, that plays a very major role in criminal law or criminal litigation, as the, as the case may be. Location of offence is crucial to determine the decision of the court. For example, if an offence is committed in Kano, that offence should be tried in Kano and nowhere else. Now, but the question is, under what law will the prosecutor prosecute the defendant is where what we are concerned with. Now, generally, they want to come up with a penal code because that's the law governing that place. But I don't think there's anything wrong using the criminal code to try someone who is not subject to the Sharia law. It's just trial. It's just for the other party to say, objection, my lord, this person is not subject to this law. But once I always say, lawyers are afraid to try new things. And sometimes they keep quiet because they feel, you know, some people see lawyers as mechanical. That is, we move on a certain way and we cannot think beyond that way. But the truth is this, that is not our fault because the system we adopt in Nigeria is called the stare decisis system where the decision of the superior court will always bind every lower court in that hierarchy. So we tend to reason in line with those at, other... At, at, the, at the higher Yeah, uh, that courts. hierarchy. However, lawyers should take the initiative to try something new. Because it's in trying something new that the Supreme Court can give a dissenting decision. Well, 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 you know this because you are a legal practitioner and you are very vast with your knowledge of the law and how they can be applied in certain instances. In a situation where you have a defendant who is oblivious of what you have just explained and a lawyer who is afraid to try out what you have just explained, how do we remedy this and ensure that justice gets to these people. Now, this is why I keep emphasizing on the word legal education. You see, legal education does not stop at the doorstep of Nigerian law school. And this is the mistake many lawyers are making. When they are done with the strenuous reading at the law school, passing the bar exams, they will make a statement. Even sign board, we will not read after the law school. You see, when you have lawyers who are not readers, it has a way of affecting the society. I keep telling people, the society of Nigeria and even the world at large rest on the feet of legal practitioners. So if we don't go extra mile learning, educating ourselves, acquiring skills that are very relevant, before we know it, like what is happening in Nigeria, they'll start looking down on the judicial system and start uh, looking down on legal practitioners. But I bet you that there are some lawyers you can't even look down on because the vast knowledge they have, you can't look down on them. Now, let's also bring it down back away from the federal government to the state level, the relationship between the State House of Assemblies and the executive arms of government. And I'd like to use Kano as a case study. One administration comes in, there's a repeal of the Emirates law. Now, whilst that repeal has taken place, they are supposed to revert away from a 5 MER state back to a 1 MER state. But we see, up until now, the difficulty with achieving a working ground norm that returns it to the former status. In cases like that, how does the executive and state assembly put their house in order in keeping with the peace that the Kano citizens look to have enjoyed during that period? Okay, one of the things you must observe is that in the legislative process, there is a time where the bills, which are the proposed law, are sent to the government for the executive assent. And that's where there's an interrelationship between the executive arm of government and the legislative arms of government. Now, paraventure, this does not work out. Now, they have a veto power, which is a two-third majority vote, to either ensure that these bills are passed. But the question is, look at how the, the State of Assembly have been fashioned. Now, members of those bodies are members of a political party to which the government or the executive government are. And definitely, they will not want to go contrary to the executive. To the executive, because they have vast number of persons in that office. For example, let's say the political party of APC. 
has the government as the executive. You could see that 90% of the House may be constituted by APC members. And this is something they plan not even before the election, but it's a ground plan to ensure that whenever they propose something to the House, there'll be no difficulty in making decisions. And this goes contrary to one of the features of the federal system of government that we should operate, which there should be a check and balances Balance, yeah. within the various arms of government. Now, I, I said that we can do because it would set the template for a non-party discussion. But now that the party <laughs> has come in, let's take it now to River State, okay. where, again, we're asking the interpretation of the law as to how seats of House of Assembly members are made vacant upon defection to another political party. That situation continued to metamorphose in River State. Uh, we've seen a back and forth. Two-thirds of the majority in the House vacated their seats at some point. There was factionality within the State House of Assembly. We saw two speakers. And many continue to question the law in some states. Uh, help us understand this as we carry our viewers along again as to what the law says in such situations in River State. Okay, generally, once you, you defect or you leave your political party, you ought to vacate the seats because you are voted by the party, even though it's an indiv individual candidacy. But that's not the issue. The issue is as to enforcement of this decision. Now, when the decisions are made, the problem we have is how do we go about enforcing this decision? The court may even give a decision, but the problem is carrying out the enforcement. So the enforcement of this decision by the court is where we have issues. Most executives do not obey court order. We could see that countless of time, but how do we check these excesses of disobedience to court order? I think this is one vacuum that the government should be looking out for. That when a decision is disobeyed, even though we have contempt of court, to what extent are the contempt of court utilized. We have them. In short, in this case, when you disobey court order, we call it in law a civil content. That's what we call it. And there are several procedures by which you can obtain the compliance to this enforcement. But you can see in reality, they don't really work. Well, well, well in closing, we have just a few uh, seconds to wrap up this particular segment. Uh, uh, what would you say is the place of the judiciary in ensuring that it's uh, highly esteemed image is restored in the uh, eyes of Nigerians and what is the place of the citizens themselves in ensuring that they go to the courts and hold elected officials accountable for the things that they should have done that they didn't do. Okay, good. Now, in as much we want to blame the judiciary, I, I would make it a two-way blame. Like I said, the judiciary are an unbiased umpire which they will not delve into their affairs while in court. So it means that lawyers or legal practitioners ought to do their homework before appearing before the court. Now, when they have presented their evidence very clearly, they present their final address to the court and they wait for the court to decide. Now, if the decision goes contrary, that is where we have the place for appeal. You can appeal. So it's a two-way thing. Now, for the citizens, when they engage lawyers, they should ensure that these lawyers are efficient, they are skilled, and they are knowledgeable on that subject matter. And when they are not, they have the power to change lawyers. You see, our rules of professional conduct, the ROPC 2023, gives them the power to change lawyers. All that it needs to be done is that when a lawyer is changed, we just need to notify the new lawyer, or the new lawyer to notify the old lawyer, that there has been a change in lawyers. And if there's any outstanding professional fees to be paid, they ensure they are paid. And that's the rule. And when we don't follow this clearly, even the, even the citizens sometimes, they have to look at the demeanor of their lawyers to be sure that this person knows what, what he or she is doing. Some clients actually, after a particular proceedings, they come out from the court and say, please, I don't want you as my lawyer again. And they go and meet the opposing lawyer and say, please, the way you performed today, I think I'm set you out of court because you did very well and I want you to be my lawyer dear after. Now you see that <laughs> lawyers, we are the center of the development in Nigeria. If we don't improve our person, if we don't improve our skills, the society will keep dying every day. And that's what's happening. So if Nigeria is bad today, if there's anybody to point out, 
point at legal practitioners. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned this because you are a legal practitioner and we will be sure to hold you accountable sure. if the society is not progressing. 100%. Well, thank you very much, Caleb Obwagwina, for finding the time to come <laughs> on the program and thank share you. your thoughts with us. Thank you.